Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features X Factor number 73, cover dated December 1991. The cover is by Larry Strom and inked by Al Milgram. And it is a bit of a chaos, very dynamic. Uh, we've got the X Factor team there taking on um, multiple problems. So uh, Jamie Madrox and his dupes duking it out there in the background. It all becomes clear what's going on in the story itself inside. But one thing that I have to note is that it is a little bit hard picking out the individual figures here on the cover. And that is really down to the uniform that the X Factor members are wearing because you've got the same colors for the uniform. And so it makes it hard to distinguish the individual characters. That therefore is an advantage of um, drawing, well really coloring, drawing and coloring um, a superhero team like the Avengers where everybody's got their own particular costume. Um, so just one thing that I wanted to point out here, but the drawing is excellent. Um, love the action, love the inventiveness of this cover. Now let's open it up to the first page. This issue itself, the first couple of issues by Peter David kind of had a nice balance of the serious and the comic. This, I mean humorous, this particular issue leans much, much more into the humor and really kind of cartoonish type humor as well. So that gives us our opening here where we've got this guy, he's on the phone to his wife, he's been having an affair, he's going through uh, the radio stations, he settles on um, a new tune by Weird Al uh, uh, Yankovic, Wings on Her Fingers. So it's um, a parody of mutants. And there's a little kind of joke here about how it's in five different editions, collect them all, so a little joke at the expense of um, Adjectiveless X-Men number one with its five different editions. And we get some of the lyrics there, it's about the multiple man, multiple man doing the things, a multiple can, so it's obviously to the tune of um, the original um, Spider-Man um, animated series, Anthem. Uh, what's he like? It's not important, multiple man, is he a lot? Or is he alone, a super clown, or a super clone? A little clue there regarding the mystery in this particular issue. The second Madrox, is he a clone? His own beginning and his own end, his own best friend, multiple man. But what I really like here in the art is Strowman's rendition of the back of a human hand. So he's obviously looking at some reference there, perhaps his own hand. Um, and it works really well because hands are hard to draw and he does an excellent job. That's what I take away primarily from this opening page. So let's turn into the splash page and we get our title there, crowd control. And what happens is um, the Jamie Madrox dupe jumps through the windshield of the guy's car and um, he's tackling um, the dupe that appeared at the end of the press conference. Um, at the end of the previous issue, who's dressed in a suit there. So it's a pretty dynamic splash page, a little bit confusing as regards what's going on, that they're crashing through uh, the window, the windshield of this guy's car. But what I really like on this particular page is the detailing there of the smashed glass from the windshield. So that's that kind of um, glass that when it's shattered, it breaks off into these little uh, crunchy bits so that you're not gonna get stabbed in the jugular by a shard of glass. Um, I forget the technical term for the, the form of glass that it is, um, but I really like that Strowman has worked in that detail into the splash page. Now the creative team is Peter David Ryder, Larry Strowman, penciler, Al Milgram, inker, Michael Heisler, letterer, and Glynis Oliver, colorist, and the title of the story, Crowd Control. And the crowd is multiple man and his various dupes. So this is a nice page as well. We get a, um, a clearer shot of the guy getting out of his car. We have all of these little cameos of rappers here. I think this guy's called Mr. Time. Is he from um, NWA? I think so. And then over there, one of these kid and play uh, type characters with the big tall haircut as well. So Strowman very good at working in little uh, cameos of uh, um, you know, celebrities, but also interestingly uh, dressed and or looking uh, civilians into the background of scenes. So this guy here, um, he's saying, I got witnesses, I got, and then he realizes all the witnesses are the same guy. So that's what we have. So we start with an action sequence really, and then we go back in time to, uh, no, well not yet do we go back in time. Again, another one of these interesting shots of uh, the crowd. Uh, look at this, so he's got this guy here on the mobility scooter 
uh, using a camcorder, taking a picture of the fight. Then we've got the TV cameraman as well. Look at all these interesting body types here as well. And again, the way that they're dressed. Very, very interesting work. There's a cat there in the background as well. So Strawman having fun with that particular panel. And um, I think the readers would have fun with it too. And then we've got our news reporter from the first issue, Ariel O'Hare, back again reporting live from downtown Washington, DC, where total confusion has broken out at what was intended to be a press conference. So she catches the reader up on what happened in the previous issue. And then here we are. We're back in the past. We're at that confrontation between uh, Madrox in the suit and Madrox on, on stage in the trench coat and the ex uh, factor uniform. That's a nice team shot there. Um, good body language as well in terms of showing the shock on the various characters' faces. Um, a little bit different with Havoc, who is much more ready for uh, action and uh, leading the team. So he says to everybody, all right, nobody move. And then, of course, Strong Guy, you know, he's there for the comic relief in part. I was going to scratch my nose. Is that okay, he says. So Val is um, panicking here. She says to Jamie, Tell me this is another stupid joke. I won't get mad, I swear. Say it's a joke. It's not a joke, he says. Oh God, it's not a joke, just shoot me now. So the press conference is a complete debacle, um, or it ends with a complete debacle. And Havoc here, as team leader, is thinking strategically, rain quick, you've got heightened sen senses. Which one is the real Madrox? And her reply is uh, problematic because she says both of them and Val is down uh, um, on her knees on the stage, uh, gripping her head in despair. You want a Valium or something, Val, says uh, Guido. So here we go, the confrontation between the two multiple men. So the suited Madrox says, since X-Factor can't keep their own house in order, I'll tell you who this man is. He's one of my multiples, broken free of me, trying to supplant my identity, but he's not the original. I am... Um, so this is the puzzle of the issue. Who is the real Jamie Madrox? This is a really nice couple of pages here, very clear art. I like the way that Strowman has rendered, um, designed uh, Madrox on stage, uh, creating these uh, dupes. So basically he uh, punches his uh, fist into the palm of one of his hands and that's that kinetic action creates the dupes, three of them there. And the guy on the floor who shouldn't be able to create any dupes if he's a dupe himself is able to so madrox takes the trench coat off that's it he says whatever's been going on lately you're the one who's behind it i know it i don't know what kind of trick you've pulled and i don't care just believe this smart guy only one of us is walking out here alive so then we get a fight between them that takes up a lot of the issue so as i said this is a really nicely designed page um this is interesting too as Madrox punches the other guy in the jaw and then they uh, start developing all these different dupes that crash out of the uh, teleconference center. So April O'Hare is out there. Even now X Factor is endeavoring to deal with the emergency. Window shattered there. And Val says, somebody please tell me how we can put a possible spin, a positive spin on this, she says. And Havoc says, shut up Val. And that's kind of a, a line he repeats throughout the issue. Um, but now he's thinking again, and this is good characterization. Rain, is there any way to tell which ones are the ones we began with? None, Alex, I'm telling you, they're identical in every respect. Perfect, he says. It's an interesting upshot on his jutting chin there, uh, three quarter profile upshot from Larry Stroman. That's um, impressive, I like it. Let's continue with the story. So then the action moves to the Smithsonian. And then we get like, this is what I said, like this is very cartoony stuff from Peter David. And I think that this is something that, you know, divided readers in terms of whether they were on board for this or whether they found it too corny. Um, in my case, I'm okay with it. I don't love it exactly. And as I said, I think the balance is wrong in this particular issue in terms of seriousness versus humor. There's a little bit too much slapstick and humor. So we've got Kermit the Frog there in the Jim um, Henson um, part of the museum. And he's obviously being um, puppeted by the other Madrox who um, punches out uh, X-Factor Jamie. And then the scene switches to outside. There's more. 
um, more action and fighting outside and Alex trying to get um, a handle on things so basically he says uh, they're still hitting but not splitting he's at his limit if the original Jamie's unconscious do his multiples disappear he asks Lorna and she says she doesn't know well Havoc says we're going to find out and Quicksilver asks you mean you want us to knock out anyone who looks like Madrox that's right Pietro Oh good, he says, shut up Pietro, that line uh, repeating through the issue. This is a nice top-down shot in the Smithsonian of suited Madrox walking um, across a tile floor. I like that. That's an interesting visual from Strowman. And um, here he's met by a, a trio. It's an interesting trio in the art. We've got um, two, two black guys and a, and a Jew here as well. So I wonder what... Uh, is the meaning of that whether that is something that Strowman has come up with um, on his own by way of the Marvel plotting or whether it's in uh, Peter David's plot but in any case it gives Strowman another um, opportunity to draw some interesting looking uh, background civilian type characters so they're mistaking Madrox in the suit for the actor uh, uh, behind the Rocketeer and um, I'm trying to remember the actor's name Brendan somebody isn't that right uh, somebody will tell me in the comments, I'm sure. I just can't remember. I might remember by the end of the video his name. He's also in The Mummy, right? Um, so in any case, uh, X-Factor Madrox uses the distraction to uh, shoulder suited Madrox into a wall. And the lads here think they're on television. Where's the camera? They're asking this, again, kind of cartoony stuff. But it's an interesting visual and interesting um, facial features for Strongman to draw. Now we've got a nice anchor image here of Strong Guy uh, basically just flicking the uh, dupes unconscious and uh, they're, they're about to attack each other en masse when Havoc uses his powers to knock them out as well. So that's the strategy for the moment. And then we pick up with Madrox, X Factor Madrox in the Smithsonian again. And the other guy is dropping um, a model of the Starship Enterprise on top of him. So they fight and they have some back and forth in their uh, dialogue here, but it doesn't really go much beyond them telling each other how much they really hate each other. This is very cartoony stuff, but it's nicely drawn and nicely told in the panel to panel um, um, storytelling by Strowman. So I like this little panel of X-Factor Madrox grabbing suited Madrox and knocking him down the stairs and over the balcony where the pair of them grab onto this uh, model biplane and then it starts falling to the ground. That's an interesting close-up too on X-Factor Madrox eye. And I like the, uh, the hatching here as well in the inks by Milgram. It's a controlled inking from him. And then we're, um, yeah, I think they, they we're, we're back outside where a couple of other dupes, it gets a little confusing at times, are, uh, are knocked into each other head first by uh, Polaris using her magnetic powers. It's an interesting way of rendering the effect as well. And I wonder what particular inking tool was used, whether it is a half dry marker or something like that that was used there. Yeah, it looks, um, it looks intriguing in any case. So Lorna says that the knocked out dukes, dupes rather, are not disappearing. And she counts 38 of them. So Havoc says, we must, we missed two nuts. Must be the originals, but where are they? They're the ones that are in the Smithsonian. Something I want to observe about the art, another additional point I want to make about the art here, is all of this noodling on Lorna's hair there. This kind of, um, yeah, I, I, that's the best way to put it. This noodling and the line work there. Do you know who it reminds me of? It reminds me of Bill Sinkevitz. So I have a feeling that... Um, Strowman could well have been an admirer of Sienkiewicz. Also, the spotting of blacks reminds me of Sienkiewicz as well. And also that design sense of Strowman's, that's something as well that he um, could have picked up from studying Sienkiewicz's work. That's a nice shot of rain there. Uh, the biplane coming out the window of the Smithsonian and um, dropping to the ground. There's those three guys from earlier as well. 
Um, and we, another reference to the Rocketeer where uh, the Jewish guy says, oh crud, I never even got a chance to ask him how much of a babe that Jennifer Connelly is. Brendan, Brendan, what's his name? What's his surname? I just cannot remember for the moment. He was in The Whale, right? Um, a couple of years ago. Remember that movie? So anyway, this is another interesting panel and shot here. So another three-quarter profile upshot on Lorna. And interesting that uh, Strowman has chosen not to draw in her jawline. Uh, so it's an, it makes for an interesting effect. And there's that noodling in the hair again that reminds me of Sienkiewicz. So um, Havoc orders Polaris to slow down the dupes. She says she's trying. Uh, it doesn't help that the plane's mostly wooden. I can't affect it directly and using mag magnetic waves isn't anywhere near as effective. But anyway, the biplane crashes and the two lads are uh, out unconscious. But the, uh, the, and Havoc says here, the other Jamies are all vanishing back to wherever the heck it is Madrox produces them from. So I guess he does have to be conscious, except Rain says, if one of these two is a dupe and they're both out, then how can they be both still here? It doesn't make sense. And that's really the mystery for the final third of the issue. But first of all, we get the TV news reporter, um, April O'Hare, turning to Strong Guy get there and saying, uh, what's she saying here? She's saying, these mutants are supposedly on our side, because of course, X Factor is a government sponsored team. Thus far, the damage in this internecine mutant squabble is estimated at hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we're looking at, we're looking to get comments from one of the mutant members of, and she's about to say, the team. And then uh, Guido turns around and he gives this big speech here. Okay, that's it, I've had it. I'm sick and tired of the word mutant. Thanks to you guys, it's one of the dirtiest words and racial slurs in this country. Mutant menace, mutant scum, mutant danger. Sure, if we had a, we had a problem today and the FF and Avengers have problems, but they're not cosmic parrot freaks or superhero vermin, but us were always nasty mutants. Remember when African Americans were Negroes or worse, when the physically challenged were cripples? Every other segment of society is now treated with verbal respect, but you guys have turned the word mutant into a buzzword meaning dangerous. It's unfair. We're not going to take it anymore. We deserve respect. We demand respect. We won't get it with the pejorative term mutant in popular use. So this is Peter David making reference to um, the rise of politically correct culture um, and in the early 90s and through the 90s. The first wave of political correctness. We've had a more recent one since about 2014. So here we go. The reporters are asking or the civilians are asking. I think they're all reporters from the, from the press conference. They're, and they're asking, OK, well, you don't want to be called mutants. Well, what would you prefer? Uh, what would you refer to individuals such as yourselves? So here he comes out and he says, we prefer the term genetically challenged or GCs for short. So to what extent is he being serious or something else going on? Well, we got to keep reading to find out. Meanwhile, we've got this subplot with Professor Vic Chalker where he's developing um, various uh, plans in order to eradicate the dangerous mutant scum menace and everything always goes wrong for him. Um, and so the suit doesn't fit his own dimensions that he built. And then we're back with X-Factor um, in their headquarters once again in Washington. And they're quizzing Strong Guy about the genetically challenged phrase. Where'd you get that from? Uh, so asks Havoc. First you come up with that idiotic Strong Guy name. And now you make it sound like being a mutant is something to be ashamed of. But this is what Guido says. He says, I'll lighten up. I was just blowing smoke to distract them while you got Jamie out of there. Those news guys won't take that GC stuff seriously, but they do on TV. And here, one of the genetically challenged spokesmen, strong guy of the new GC team. So Havoc is um, outraged. And Lorna says, don't be a blork, very early 90s term. And Havoc says, what are you on his side? And she says, I'm not on, on anyone's side. Um, she asks him, don't you see what you're doing? Now, this is an interesting bit of characterization. You're trying to be like Scott again. Scott's so deadly serious about everything. So you feel you have to be uh, too. If Scott smiled, his face would crack some role model. I mean, look at you. You wear your headgear all the time. You're getting like the guy in Doonesbury who always wears his helmet. Come on, blow off some steam. Right, Guido? 
so Guido uh, agrees but Rain of course always takes Havoc's side and so she says here just because he's properly appreciative of the stakes and the two of ye are immature oafs doesn't mean but they're interrupted by Val and the two Madroxes have been put in these chairs to limit their movement so they can't create any new dupes and basically they don't get anywhere in terms of finding out which is the real one or other and X Factor Madrox is um, aghast that the team are falling for the, uh, the lies as he sees it of the suited Madrox and Guido says I hate to say it but it's not impossible um, uh, what's that it's not impossible that X Factor Madrox could be uh, the false Madrox so they leave and they're trying to figure out what to do next and Rain says here what you need is a telepath to tell who's lying our luck were the only mutant group on the planet without a resident telepath so Val has a little joke there genetically challenged group Rain she doesn't like that at all but I like the art and I like Strowman's choice there to uh, put Rain's face in deep silhouette it makes her more bestial looking really kind of sells the anger in her and Alex says we don't need a TP a telepath people determine truths all the time Val will need a polygraph expert considering the circumstances will need the best so we get a little interesting characterization of Val Cooper here where she says oh I know the best he owes me two favors I'll call him Quicksilver what are the two favors that he owes you the first Pietro is that I married him the second is that I divorced him so interesting background information on Val and of course we'll get that developed in subsequent issues but then we're, we have a little uh, back and forth between the two Madroxes and again the reader is unclear in terms of which is the real one uh, though we suspect the suit guy is the, uh, the false one and then far from the madding crowd that guy we saw in the previous issue in front of his bank of TV screens this is going perfectly he says first Quicksilver and now Madrox who next to use my ricochet abilities on whose confidence will I erode whose public image will I shatter so who's he going to choose ah of course yes he will most definitely be the one it is strong guy Guido who appeared on TV so he's next up in the mystery villains targets and sites next monumental headaches that's a nice image drawing of Guido there as well in his x-factor uniform so the latest page concerns issue number 70 which was Peter David's first it was kind of like a transition issue at the end of the Shadow King saga and just before obviously the all new all different x-factor team in issue 71 so everybody's very happy with that um, issue 70 and in particular Peter David's humor in the issue and there you go I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on X Factor number 73. Let me know your thoughts on the comic itself in the comments to the video. Is it Brendan McCarthy? Is that his name? Brendan McCarthy, the actor? Let me know who the actor is in the comments to the video. And if you enjoyed my review and commentary, please like the video on YouTube. It really helps the channel. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.